is a rock and roll horror movies and tattoo show. <laughs> Welcome, and thank you for joining me for the Rock and Roll Horror Movies and Tattoos Show. Today I've got a very special treat for you kitties, and that is a very special conversation with Danny Hicks, who is most notably known as the effervescent Jake in Evil Dead 2, Dead by Dawn, or as well as having been an intruder, who also has a new movie coming out called Elder Island. And he's going to join me today for a special conversation here on the Rock and Roll Horror Movies movies and tattoo show so buckle up sit tight get ready it's gonna be a fun one also have jen gonna serve up some horror movie reviews and this is gonna be the werewolf edition one of my favorite uh subject matters she's gonna be covering american werewolf in london the howling and bad moon and also i'll be hitting you with another top 10 list and i've got some music videos to share with you i'm also gonna be talking about my buddy jake murphy's special effects makeup crew in michigan and the film that they just wrapped up called uber killer we'll have a clip from that too we've also got tales of the tattoo where i'll be reading stories from viewers talking about their most horrific or at the very least interesting experience that they've had either getting a tattoo themselves or watching someone else getting a tattoo and we'll be reading that off here in the show too so get ready for it it's going to be a pretty awesome show we've got the rock and roll horror movies and tattoo show Okay, I'm going to go ahead and ring up Danny Hicks on the Skype line right now. Let's go ahead and get him going, and we'll get this conversation started. Mr. Danny Hicks, how are you? All right, baby. Hey, man, how's it? Bobby Joe! Bobby Joe, where are you, girl? (laughs) Last night I asked my my four-year-old granddaughter if she wanted a grilled cheese sandwich. She says, why don't we ever have boy cheese sandwiches? <laughs> Funny as hell. Wow. And this is this is about six months ago or so. I, I was trying to teach her uh, the intro from one of the old Beatles songs. Where she goes, I want, I do, I want, three, three, four, boom, six, a lot, a lot, you know. <laughs> so six months go by or something, a long time goes by, and she says, hey, Gumpa, watch this. She goes, I want, I do, I want, two, three, four, twinkle, twinkle, little star. <laughs> you go, so, man. Like songs she knew. <laughs> Yeah, those uh, any timeless classic can be uh, livened up with a one, two, three, four intro. <laughs> Pretty cool, man. I want to welcome you, and I want to thank you for joining me for a special conversation on the Rock and Roll Horror Movies and Tattoos show. Which and, is a very cool show. Well, I, only, I just watched the one. I think it was about 10 minutes long. I thought it was wonderful. And I love the way you incorporate YouTube, you know, to add the, the visual uh, stimuli. It's, that's, right. that's really very smart. Basically, what I'm trying to do with these shows is my small part to try to keep the genre fresh. There's so much of a younger audience today who really have no idea about the older classic horror movies, you know, or even actresses and actors, you know, such as yourself who have been involved with the making of those kind of movies. Speaking of which, it's really cool to see that you are continuing an active role in uh, both music and movies today. And um, I know that I understand that you have a, a feature film that's coming out real soon called Elder Island. Can you tell the fans a little bit about it? Okay, Elder Island. It's um, really a pretty cool little story. Uh, it's based on a true story. And evidently back in the 1850s, there was a, uh, a sect of the Mormon Church in Michigan uh, that moved out on, onto an island called Beaver Island in the middle of Lake Michigan. And the head of the church decided that being the head of the church wasn't enough. He wanted to be the king of mm-hmm. the church and the king of Michigan. Right. So uh, one thing led to another, and his, his followers got really fed up with him, and they, they killed him. Uh, so that's kind of what our movie's based on. Of course, in our movie, being dead isn't quite good enough. He's got to come back, because I'm originally from Michigan, so... Uh, it was fun. We shot the whole thing in Michigan with some uh, Tim Quill is in the movie also, and he's also from Michigan. And we used a lot of local talent, which uh, for some reason there seems to be an absolute abundance of good talent in Michigan. Uh-huh. So it was a lot of fun. It was a whole lot of fun to do that. And it's uh, coming out this spring. I don't know exactly when yet, but 
uh, sometime I think in May. Yeah. Wow, that sounds very interesting. I like the sounds of that already. I know that's going to be sick and twisted. Now, is this slated for a theatrical release, or is it going to be an on-demand thing, um, Blu-ray, that sort of thing? No, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm i not really sure. I mean, they've talked about doing all different types of releases. I, I, I'm hoping for a theatrical release, but, you know, I'm not on the, in the money into things, so I don't really know what they're, you know, eventually going to do with it, but... Um, I'll let people know. Watch my fan page and, and Facebook and stuff, and uh, I'll let y'all know when it's happening. Oh, absolutely. I, you know, I tell everybody about the fan page and, you know, get over there and throw a thumbs up on it, Danny Hicks, you know, the Danny <laughs> Hicks fan page, and make sure everybody, you know, does it. And, of course, those that don't do it, you know, will pay dearly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, Danny, I think one of the benefits and one of the upsides to uh, on-demand video as well as DVD, Blu-ray, streaming video, that sort of thing, is just the availability of it. You know, people can anytime watch a good movie on their devices or on their 4K TVs. Or You know, if you would have told somebody that, you know, 20 years ago that you were going to watch most of the movies that you watch on your phone, you know, of course, they would have thought you were a total, you know, just a nut job. Right. But I can't remember the last time I was in a theater. You know, I, in fact, the last time I think I was in a theater, and shame on me indeed, was uh, the premiere for My Name is Bruce. No I kidding. That was the last time I actually saw a movie in a theater. Uh, it, like you said, you don't need to go out anymore. I think it's kind of a, unfortunately, I think it's kind of a dying thing, the theater. I think it's kind of on its last legs, you know? There was a, a place here in Zephyr Hills, right up here in downtown. But um, we had a theater. Basically, what they did was they took an old, you know, old rotted, gutted out theater and they redid it. But what they started doing was they started playing all these old universal horror movies like, you know, Dracula, Frankenstein, Wolfman, Mummy, which I thought was really cool. It didn't last long, obviously. I, you know, I don't guess they, uh, I don't guess they really went too far with it. But that's pretty cool i'd like to see something like that come back well you know you see those places that, that pop up and, and it's and it's really neat uh, unfortunately i don't think you can make enough money doing it you know right so i'm ashamed but uh, it's, it seems like everything is going uh, you know the way of uh eight uh, tracks you know eight track tapes and uh, i don't know i mean nowadays if you want music you you have to download it you can't really get the cds anymore movies you you know you stream mm -hmm. stream them on netflix or whatever so that seems to be the way that people are, are appreciating the art that we try so hard to make nowadays and i guess that's all right you know it's just kind of the way things go i guess yeah and, and i agree with you it does seem like something's getting lost you know it's like a dying art almost you know going to the theater it was almost you know part of the fun of it was you know actually going to the you know the theater and actually being there yeah. you know but and of course as we're seeing this everybody's laughing at us because uh, star trek no, it's not Star Trek. Star Wars just came out and broke every box office record. <laughs> there he is. And right. <laughs> right. Kind of making it sound a little silly right now. But. Well, that's that, That's pretty cool, though. Uh, so Elder Island. Uh, that's, uh, Elder so Island. It'll be out in the springtime. People can get ready for that. And, uh, yeah, it sounds like it has a really cool storyline. Now, I mean, I, I don't want you to divulge too much information, obviously. Wait for it to come out. But do you play the preacher? I do not. Uh, and it's really kind of hard to talk about it without giving too much away, but... Uh, yeah. You'll recognize me, and they, they contacted me, I don't know, uh, probably six or eight months before they started filming, and they actually wanted me to play a different role than the one I ended up with. Um, and But after I read the script, I, I, I talked to the director, and uh, I said, now, you know what, I really want to play this other guy. And he said, why? And I said, well, because he has no redeeming qualities. I think that's very interesting, you know? <laughs> so that's what we did. So that's about all I can tell you. My character really has no redeeming qualities. <laughs> that's cool. Well, I wanted to ask you also, uh, Danny, about your um, your music endeavors, man. I know that you, uh, you know, could you divulge some information about what you got going on with your music? Well, it, it's, it's kind of a long story, but uh, music was, was my first love. Uh, unfortunately, I remember that I was probably 10 or 11 years old playing my, my old man's guitar and singing along with myself. And I remember him coming up to me and said, son, if your voice ever goes on the air, I will quit breathing it. So about 15 years later, when I first made, made, when I made my first uh, national radio commercial, I sent him a copy of a little note that says, Dad, I kept my end of the bargain. <laughs> so, but oh. it, it, it was kind of my first love. Uh, and I, I don't know, I, I was very young and <clears throat> got sidetracked and life came around. So I, I, but I ended up being an actor. Uh, and because of that, uh, I met a guy named Tim O'Sabin. Uh, I was at a, a horror convention, I believe in 
Cincinnati. And it was kind of the way, funny the way it happened because the horror conventions, they usually separate uh, the celebrities from, uh, from the vendors. And it, in this case, for some reason, they'd given my table away. So they put me in with the vendors. And it just so happened that I was sitting right next to Tim O'Saban and uh, we started talking and he was a huge Evil Dead fan. Mm -hmm. and, and we spent a few hours that, that weekend drinking heavily and talking nonsense. Mm -hmm. And about a week or so after the, the the convention, he sent me a song that he had uh, written and recorded called "The Battle of uh, the Ballad of Jake and Bobby Joe," which I thought was really cool. So then one thing led to another, and we talked some more. And, and uh, I went to St. Louis and recorded uh, some of the vocals with him for that that particular song. And then we just decided that we made a pretty good pair. So we're working on our fourth album right now. Uh, it should be out. Uh, probably in the next month or so. And it's just been uh, just a lot of fun, just a, just a whole lot of fun. And it's, it's great working with, with Tim and Ian Baird. It's, uh, it's kind of like uh, my first love uh, yeah. has come back, and I've, I've been able to enjoy myself. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. awesome, man. It sounds good, too. The music's really good. Uh, the impression I got from it was kind of almost like a post-punk, you know, with a metallic edge to it. I really dug it. Really good stuff. Well, uh, Timo is a musician. He's been around forever and ever and ever. He's played with uh, Fragile Porcelain Mice and uh, uh, Ultraman and a lot of the big punk stuff that came out of St. Louis he was involved in. Uh, but the one, the band that Tim and I are in, it's called Tim O and Danny Hicks Brain Invasion. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Tim O got his, his own music on the side because, you know, that's what he does for a living. He's a professional musician. Yeah. So, uh, what do people ask you to do the most when they see you at conventions and stuff? Oh, they all want to hear Bobby Joe. <laughs> How'd I know that was coming, man? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, I did, I did Comic-Con a few years ago, and, and there was some idiot in there that he wanted to pay me just an enormous sum of money to record me screaming Bobby Joe so he could use it as, as his uh, phone message, <laughs> you know, notification message. <laughs> it's just nuts. Uh, for some reason, they're looking at their minds and they love to hear me scream it. Huh? You want to hear it? Mommy, Joe! Mommy, Joe! <laughs> well, can you tell us, uh, can you, can you uh, other than um, Elder Island, which I know it's going to be badass, that painting that I did for you. Now, was that a screenshot from the movie? You know, where you're standing there with a, are you holding a machete or are you holding a bat? or? Uh, actually, it's a corn knife. A corn knife. It's called, it's, it's kind of in between a, a large butcher knife and a machete, so... Yeah, and that's what it is. Uh, so, I mean, by the way, you, you improved upon that picture. I mean, it's a uh, great job. A very great job. So. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, I thought, well, I didn't know anything about the movie, but I thought, well, what could I do to try to embellish on this? Uh, so I stuck you in the woods. It's like, you know, what can I do to make this a little bit, you know, more threatening? I, I didn't have to do much. <laughs> but sticking you in the woods, you know, I thought it would be kind of cool. And um, Very cool. Good job. Good job. Okay. In fact, time to talk about you for a minute. I watched that little thing that you posted on Facebook the other day where you're doing a, your version of Yoda. And I gotta tell you, Dad, it's just so fucking awesome to see somebody that has a talent to be able to create something like that with nothing but a pad of paper and a pencil and oh. start drawing. I mean, that is just that is just amazing. That's amazing. In fact, if I ever decide that I'm gonna get a tattoo, I don't care where you are. I'm coming to you to get it. You heard it here, folks. <laughs> Denny Hicks is going to get tattooed by Steve Gray from the Rock and Roll Horror Movies and Tattoo Show. <laughs> Absolutely. That's high praise coming from you, man. Seriously, I, I really do appreciate that. And hell yeah, man, you know, you, you, you got the hookup anytime you want it. Um, cool, other than the Elder Island, this is what I wanted to ask you. Can you tell us anything that you got, any any, any other future plans, uh, whether it be music, uh, movies? Are you going to be doing any voice work for anybody? or? Well, you know, that stuff, I, I kind of retired last year. Uh, and not that I stopped working, it's just that I stopped looking for work. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I don't know, you know, people send me scripts all the time and I read them, and if I think there's something really interesting, then uh, we'll take it from there. Uh, so, I really d don't have any plans right now. I think I've got like two upcoming conventions to do this year. One in uh, London, Ontario, Canada in May, and then I'm gonna do a convention in Billings, Montana in October. And uh, other than that, I, I really don't have much planned right now. Um, we'll see. You know, like I said, people send me stuff all the time to read. And if I find something that's, that's really interesting, then I'll, we'll take it further than that. But uh, Very cool. right now, I'm kind of enjoying the 
semi-retired life and playing with my four and a half year old granddaughter. Hey, there you go, man. Just a hell of a lot more entertaining than any movie I've ever seen. Yeah, absolutely. But there is something else I wanted to ask you. I understand that there's a a really funny story in reference to um, something that happened on the set of My Name is Bruce, that movie you were in. Could you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, that, that was an interesting movie. Uh, Tim Quill and I, who are, you know, we've worked on several projects to, together now. Uh, in fact, he's in Elder Island also. Uh, he and I went up to Oregon to make this movie with Bruce Campbell. Uh, and there was no script for us. There was nothing in the script for either Tim or myself. And Bruce just said, just do whatever you want to do. Come up with some shit and I'll put it in the movie. So we said, okay. So we're talking, and you know, the whole, the whole movie's about Bruce making fun of himself. So mm-hmm. I thought, well, I'll make fun of Jake from Evil Dead, too. And, and Tim Quill played the, the blacksmith in Army of Darkness. So he said, well, okay, then I'll make fun of the blacksmith from Army of Darkness. And we'll just go back and forth, you know, and have some dialogue. So we're sitting and ready to shoot. And they got the light set. Everything's ready to go. And Bruce finally walks up to us and says, what are you guys going to do? So we told him, you know, I said, well, I'm going to make fun of Jake. And, and Tim's going to make fun of the blacksmith. And, and Bruce says, okay, that's good. That'll, that'll work. That's so good. Uh, but you're gay. Roll the cameras. <laughs> so he made us a gay couple. And we didn't even see it coming. We didn't know anything about it. So we did the rest of the, of the movie as a gay couple, and it was just, it's just hilarious. It's funny as hell. <laughs> I mean, and Tim, halfway through the, the first take, he reaches over and grabs my hand. He says, I wish I could quit you. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I'm trying, I'm trying so hard not to laugh. I think I peed my pants just a little bit. <laughs> is that in the movie? I mean, is that actually in the, in the movie? They use that take. <laughs> Very cool. I'm going to check that out, man. And, then that, and that's called My Name is Bruce? My Name is Bruce, yeah. Okay, cool. Sure, yeah. It's just Bruce Campbell making fun of himself and, and his chin and all the other projects he's ever done. It's it's uh, very cool. In fact, we shot it in his backyard in Oregon. You know, he has a huge, huge chunk of property up in Oregon. So that's where we shot the whole thing right in his backyard. It's, it's really interesting. It's a good movie. That's cool. Everybody wants to hear Bobby Joe. And that's cool. I, I, that, that's cool. I like that. But my favorite was always uh, that part where you go, these pages don't mean squat. <laughs> Besides, you ain't got no choice. Now move, huh? <laughs> uh-huh. That's right. I'm running this show now. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. When we were doing that scene, when we were filming it, uh, I, I, I thought the audience would actually have some sympathy for my character. You know, because hell, I was just trying to say, Bobby Joe, and you can't blame the guy. Right. And Sam Raimi says, trust me, Danny, when the kids see this, you're going to have 800 kids jump up and scream, no, you asshole. <laughs> and he was <laughs> absolutely right. I mean, it, when I throw those pages down in the, in, in the, into the cellar, there was I, half the audience jumped up and said, no, you asshole. <laughs> he knew exactly <laughs> Right. Yeah, that was my favorite part. But what were you saying? You were saying something about uh, it's been said or the word is that you that you got the gig with Evil Dead 2 because you knew those guys or something like that. Oh, yeah, they had a, a, a whole clique of people that were into making movies. I mean, it was a whole bunch of them. But the, the main people, of course, were, were uh, Bruce Campbell, uh, Sam Raimi and Rob Tappert and Scott Spiegel. They were all together, and they, they just said they were, they'd been making uh, little tiny films you know, all the way through junior high school and stuff. So people, a lot of people just assumed that because we're from the same area, I got the gig because of that. But that's not true. I didn't know those guys. In fact, the only, only one out of the whole bunch of them that I knew was Ted Ramey. And the only reason I knew him is because I actually got him a part in a, 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 a theatrical production. Uh, of See How You Run. Uh, a friend of mine was directing it, and she asked me to help cast it. So we auditioned Ted, and uh, I, I gave him the job. So he was the only one we knew. So my uh, my agent called me one day, and she says, they're doing a feature film. It's called Evil Dead 2, and there's a character named Jake, and the only description they have for the character is Scuzz Bucket. I said, huh, okay, well, that's interesting. So... <laughs> 
I got up that morning, I went out to my, my car, and I opened up the hood and took a bunch of grease and dirt and filth from the engine compartment and combed my hair with it. <laughs> and, I, and washed it all over my face and stuff, and then picked up some gravel and rocks and stuff from the driveway and was, you know, just squeezed that all in there, so I just looked god-awful bad. <laughs> so, and I put on an old filthy pair of uh, coveralls, and I went into the audition, and I said, you want a scuzz bucket? You want to see him this scuzzy? And I leaned right into the camera, and I'll never forget Sam Raimi said, my God, an actor without an ego. I love it. <laughs> oh, that's great. There's something else that was really cool about it. This I didn't find out until years later, uh, but they had already auditioned the part of Jake in, uh, in, in Los Angeles and New York, and they couldn't find anybody that you know what they really thought would be good for the role. So just kind of like the last minute, they said, well, let's we'll audition in Detroit. Uh, so they did, and I came in, and I got the part. But I, I found out years later that if they wouldn't have found somebody in Detroit, that uh, Sam Raimi was going to play the role himself. You mean the role of Jake? Yes, Sam was going to direct and play Jake. Oh wow! Yeah. So my very first feature film, I blew Sam Raimi out of the out of the water for you know a really nice part. So there's Sam Raimi. <laughs> <laughs> I did want to ask you also about. Um, Dark Man and Spider Man. I know that you got some appearances in those movies too, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Spider Man was just, even though uh, I think I'm on on film for about two seconds. I think I have one line, uh, but I was on a set for like ten weeks. It was crazy. I mean, we shot that that whole scene on a train where where Doc Ock or where uh, Spider Man's trying to keep the the runaway subway car from going off the edge of the tracks. So we shot that forever. I mean, it took forever to shoot that scene. So um, I had a very very small part in it, but my banker thought it was great. He just loved that movie. It was uh-huh. wonderful. Yeah, yeah. That's and, a- and Dark Man. Um, I don't die in that movie. You don't see my character be killed. But in reality, we shot for, I think, two days, or I'm sorry, almost two weeks killing me. And you don't see it in the movie. They had some technical problems, so they had to to cut the whole scene out. But it was just supposed to be myself and Dark Man, and the character I played was Skippy. And he, he comes into my apartment, and he grabs me around the throat, and he throws me the entire length of my apartment. And they didn't want it to look like there was any drop off, you know, like there, there was any force of gravity. So they actually built an apartment for me that was on its side so that the walls were actually the floor and the ceiling. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Okay. Then they, they found a one legged stuntman, a guy that really only had one leg, that looked similar to me. And they, they put three high speed cameras in there and they dropped my machine gun legs through the frames and then he jumped and he fell 18 feet and landed right on his stump and I just thought oh my it shook the whole set he landed so hard I thought it killed him but didn't hurt him at all the problem was yeah it's I mean I don't even think anybody said cut I think they just said call 911 (laughs) it scared everybody but then Dark Man picks me up and he starts punching holes through this cinder block wall all the way around my head and it was real cinder block so they were using a, like a, a big chunk of steel with a hydraulic ram that was punching these holes in the cinder block around my head and they could see the, the application the, 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 the device so they couldn't use it so they scrapped the whole damn thing but uh, they made my part a lot smaller but it was it was a lot of fun to work with uh, Liam Neeson for a whole week yeah, I was going to ask you, uh, what kind of guy is Liam Neeson? He seems like a really, you know, hardcore badass in the movies and whatnot. Every one of them, you know. No, he's he's um, he's not a badass at all. He's in fact he's a real friendly guy. Uh, uh, he plays a badass very well. So I imagine that's that's probably why you see him doing that so often. But uh, here's here's a typical Liam Neeson thing. Um, I was in a restaurant having dinner a couple months, maybe three months after we, we finished shooting Dark Man. And uh, he, he comes in and sits down and, and he's ordering dinner and stuff. And I, I look over and I see him. He's with Courtney Cox. He says, Donnie, get over here, get over here. So I went over and he spent, he spent like 20 minutes telling Courtney Cox what a great actor I was. So that's that's the real Liam Neeson. He's a pretty cool guy. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, of 
Hard Knock spent that entire time just drooling on Courtney Cox. <laughs> right, rightly so. Yeah. Did you get to go home with her? Jeez, uh, Steve, come on, man. <laughs> I'm not going to tell. <laughs> Inquiring minds want to know. Well, tell them to buy a fucking ticket. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and thinking about like Spider Man, and it's just so weird, you know, because I had watched, well, obviously, Spider Man came out before Drag Me to Hell. Did you, do you have any sort of a role in Drag Me to Hell that I might not know? No, uh, I didn't. And the reason is because I, I believe they shot it in New Zealand. It's like they're shooting the, the television series in, in New Zealand. So it's, uh, you know, it's cost prohibitive. It costs a tremendous amount of money to take an actor from, from Los Angeles and fly him to New Zealand. So, no. And, I didn't. But it was it was so weird, you know. Spider Man just seemed like such a departure, you know, from the stuff that uh, Sam Raimi had done, you know. And it's cool, you know. It just shows versatility. Yeah, yeah I'm beginning to think that Sam Raimi could do just about anything he wants to. He's he is so cool to work with. I mean, it's it's not like you're even working. It's like you're playing and having fun. You know, I mean, he he, he makes sure he gets what he wants, but he doesn't do it uh, by saying no, don't do it that way. You know, he he does it by just sitting down and talking to you, and he he's, he gets real excited, and he's like a little kid. You know, he'll say, okay, and then the bad guy pulls your leg off and goes boom, 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 boom starts shooting people, and <laughs> he's making the sound effects. And stuff. <laughs> so yeah, man, have you decided on your on your next tattoo? <laughs> No, actually, I don't have any tattoos, but I'm telling you in the whole world right now, if I can ever think of something that I want to say forever, you're going to do it for me. I've been looking I've been looking at you to get your work on Facebook, and it's absolutely amazing, man. Thanks, man. You're a gifted, talented artist, and it kind of pisses me off. Well, you know, it actually kind of pisses me off, too, because, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's one of those things, you know, it. It's so funny, you know, because back in the day, it was like just something I did, you know, because I spent a lot of time alone and I was a loner in high school, you know, so I really wasn't, I didn't hang out, you know, I wasn't a big party or so I wasn't hitting all the big party scenes everywhere. But uh, so art was kind of like an escape for me. But, you know, it, the question that I would get would be, how come you're not an artist? <laughs> Uh, I am an artist. <laughs> uh, another one is, you know, when you're sitting there drawing this really sick piece, you know, real badass piece, high definition type stuff, you know, somebody comes up and says, wow, that would look great as a tattoo. And I'm like, um, okay, it doesn't look good now or, <laughs> you know. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of went through the same thing in high school, too. I, I, I was pretty much a loner, and my escape was I, I read a lot. I, I still read a lot. Uh, to this very day, I think I'd rather read a book, a good book, than I would uh, watch a movie. So uh -huh. I'm still. Who's your uh, favorite writer? Well, I, th I think the all time greatest author, maybe in, in the history of this country, was Kurt Vonnegut Jr. Uh, he's, he just wrote some amazing thing. In fact, there's a there's a book uh, that he wrote called Breakfast of Champions that I I think should be mandatory reading for anybody in this country because he's just it just explains things in in black and white that makes so much sense that nobody ever thinks of. You know, so it's um, he really changed my right my life by reading that book. What's his name again, and what's the name of the book? Kurt Vonnegut Jr. And the name of the book is Breakfast of Champions. Yeah, I'd like to check that out. What it's about? It's only about I don't know, maybe two hundred pages long, and it's uh, uh, it, it's really just a silly little thing that he wrote. In fact, I think someplace he he said that it was his sixtieth birthday present to himself. So it's it's really a very interesting book to read, and he draws pictures in it with a felt tip pen and starts to. It's nothing that he took real serious, but it's something that I, I definitely took serious. Because there's a lot of very important life lessons in it. Oh, yeah, see, I'd like that. You read it, and I, 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 guarantee, I guarantee you'll thank me for it. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's next up on the uh, reader's list. Does it is it available in um, audiobook form, too, or is it just a straight print? I, I don't know. Um, he was a very, uh, one of the 60s and 70s, he was one of the... Uh, authors so it wouldn't surprise me if it was an audio form but then again i don't know but uh, it's, it's a pretty cool book anyway you get it yeah i wanted to talk a little bit more about the brain invasion uh -huh. and you said that you you'd mentioned that you guys are coming out with your fourth album uh right. do you have any kind of like a synopsis as what the songs are about or no it's a little bit of everything it's uh, 
it's funny the way Tim and I work is uh, Tim writes most of the music and I write most of the lyrics and then we, we get to re together and re record them uh, but he'll start out just plunking around with his guitar and within a few minutes uh, I'll be listening to it and within a few minutes I say okay this is what this song's about and I'll just take it from there and, and we do the work together so uh, it, it, it's a little bit of everything a little bit of silliness it's just Somebody described it as a punk mash music because Tim being a punker and me being an Elvis Presley fan kind of banged our heads together to get this sound that's pretty much our own. So Yeah, it is definitely unique. I like it, man. It's like I was telling you the other day. It's kind of, well, to me anyway, it, it's kind of got that post-punk feel to it and it's got some metal to it. And yeah, yeah I can I can see some uh, kind of rockabilly type uh, influence in there when, with your playing and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. I, I really enjoy it. I mean, I never thought I'd get the chance to actually record music, but uh, thanks to Tim O, uh, it all worked out. Now, speaking of uh, recording music, well, I'm assuming he lives there in town with you, and you guys get together no. frequently? No, that's that's the biggest problem. Uh, he lives in St. Louis. Um, well, actually, outside of St. Louis. And he has a recording studio in uh what the hell's the name of the town? It's actually in Illinois. It's across the Mississippi from St. Louis. Um and I can't remember the town. It's a tiny little town. It's maybe got less than a thousand people live there. So uh, we, we, we talk a lot on the phone and, and back and forth with text messages and stuff. And, and then maybe once a year or twice a year, I'll fly to St. Louis and, and we'll go to work. Uh, and the, our drummer also, Sir Ian Baird, as we refer to him, uh -huh. uh, he lives in that area too. So um, it, we, I would really like to do some live performances, but it would it would be very difficult because there's six or seven instruments at least in every song. Uh, in Tim O, in between Tim O and uh, Ian, they play them all. So in order to do this, we would have to hire a bunch of musicians. Uh, I'd have to be there for rehearsals and everything else before we could actually go and perform live. But we, we still talk about it. It might happen one day. Hey, well, this, um, if you don't mind a little bit of a shameless plug real quick, if you ever need a bass player, I'm available. <laughs> and a boy, and a boy. Well, Tim plays the bass, so you can fight it out with him. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, he's, I watch him play the guitar, and I am just amazed. I am absolutely amazed. And I, I, I've been interested in music my whole life, and I've seen a lot of the best, and Tim O is right there with him. He's right there with him. Yeah, he is a great player. You can see that. Well, you're a great player. I mean, you got some, you got hella chops, too, man. Well, my problem is I, I'm getting old, man. I've got arthritis in my hands real bad now, and I also have something called a peripheral neuropathy, where the nerve endings in my hands and my feet are dying, so it, it makes even picking your guitar up very very painful so I, I don't play very much anymore yeah, it was good enough well that's cool you still got the vocal cords you, you know you're, you're working the microphone pretty good yeah well the, the most the, the thing I enjoy about it is the most is, uh, is writing the lyrics I mean that's that's real challenging yeah uh, it's like putting together a big jigsaw puzzle but turned over backwards you know there's no picture so uh, it's, it's fun I have a lot of fun doing it that is cool as hell can you do me? Uh, can you do me? The pages don't mean squatting. Besides, I'm running. <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh huh. Uh -huh. That's right. I'm running this show now. These pages don't mean squat. Now we're gonna go out in the woods and we're gonna look for Bob Jones and find her. Now move. <laughs> <laughs> Danny, man, it's an honor, man. It's really an honor talking to you, and I really appreciate you being here. Uh, thank you, Steve. Honor's all mine, man. Thank you very much. All right, well, get ready for it because you're gonna enjoy it. Show sure enough. <laughs> all right, <laughs> now, <man>. move. <laughs> now move. Now <laughs> move. All right, man. I'll talk to you later, Danny. All right, Steve. Thanks a lot, man. Thanks, man.
Okay, this is my list of 10 rock and roll and heavy metal songs that could make good horror movies. We'll start with number 10, Run Through the Jungle by Creedence Clearwater Revival. Released during my actual birth month and year of April 1970, this song led many to believe that it was about the Vietnam conflict. That being said, I visualize a horror movie about a lone journalist photographer who travels to the former war-ravaged jungles of Vietnam only to be hunted by a unit of undead Viet Cong phantoms. Number 9, Godzilla by Blue Oyster Cult. This is without a doubt self-explanatory, but with a twist, I imagine a film with a Blair Witch tip regarding a rock band whose performance in Japan is cut short because of the behemoth lizard. Number 8, The Preacher by Testament. Now this was a toss-up between two Testament songs from the same album entitled The New Order, one being Eerie Inhabitants and the other being The Preacher. The possibilities are vast for both, but I picture The Preacher being more effective as a dark being providing insight into people's impending dooms. Number seven, Children of the Grave by Black Sabbath. This would be a writer's paradise. Imagine a movie that places a group of people on an expedition in an ancient cemetery and upon entering a forgotten mausoleum are trapped and are summarily picked off one at a time by demonic undead kids. Number six, You're No Good by Linda Ronstadt. A jilted lover, an angry woman who spits her anger towards someone who has wronged her over a tumultuous relationship telling her lover of their shortcomings as their body hangs on the wall of the cellar, cut up and bleeding. Number five, Witch Hunt by Rush. This song, released on the 1981 album Moving Pictures, would make an awesome horror movie. I picture something in the vein of Horror Hotel with Christopher Lee where modern day misfits who are thought to be witches turn the tables on their accusers in a variety of painful ways. Number four, Frankenstein by the Edgar Winter Group. Another self-explanatory tune whose title says it all, but imagine a modern film with Karloff's trademark makeup monster terrorizing it in modern ways comparative to the Saw and Hostile flicks. Number three, Kill You by Korn. This song could plot a movie from the perspective of an abused child whose horrible home life keeps him oppressed, and then he eventually grows old enough to turn the blades on the very ones who abused him all his life. Number two, Iron Man by Ozzy Osbourne. This film could tell the tale of an astronaut who suffers in a severe accident during a space mission, leaving him with a curious iron deficiency disorder and a psychotic state, causing him to have horrifying, hyper-realistic delusions and hallucinations. It could be filmed in the same fashion of Jacob's Ladder, the movie with Tim Robbins. And finally, number one, Trapped Under Ice by Metallica. What's not horrifying about being trapped under ice? This movie could be set in the Great White North where members of a survival club find themselves trapped under mountains of snow after an avalanche. Only, they're also pinned on top of a frozen lake where the ice is dangerously thin in unpredictable places. There you have it. Ten rock and roll and heavy metal songs that I think would make pretty decent horror movies. Blood cleanup kit in it. No one knows, cause I keep them windows mad tinted. I drive at night, looking for them drunk bitches. Choke them out, throw the dead bodies in the ditches. Horror fans, next up, I'm extremely pleased and honored okay. to have a friend of mine, Jake Murphy from Cryptcraft Special Effects Studio, join me. The floor is yours, Jake. Welcome. Hello, Jake Murphy here, co-owner of Cryptcraft Productions. Before I get into what we do and what we're all about, I do want to say thank you for having us on the show. It really is an honor to be featured in the program. So it all started in the 80s. My little brother and I, who is a few years younger than me, Zach Murphy, who is also the co-owner of Cryptcraft Productions, we grew up in that VHS era. You know, I, I remember going with my parents to Meyer, which is, you know, a superstore up here in the Midwest, and they had a little uh, video rental place inside. My dad didn't care what we picked out. I mean, we could we could go in there and 
of course, two little boys, we're going to pick out the boxes with skulls on it and monsters and everything. So we, we grew up on horror and we loved it. You know, there's something, something to say about that childhood fear. You know, staying up till 2 o'clock in the morning in your little couch or your sofa fort with the blankets on and drinking pop and watching scary movies. You know, there's, there's, there's some magic to that. You know, I always look back to those days. I mean, I, and basically, what I try to do is recreate that for the new generation. And that's what Crivecraft is all about. You know, if you watch modern film, a lot of it is just full of garbage CGI effects and just horrible looking creatures. You know, when I watched movies back in the 80s, you know, with all the practical effects, the puppetry and the sculpting and the, you know, it, they, they were tangible creatures. I mean, you, you could grab them right off the screen. And that's scary. You know, I, I've got two little girls now and, you know, when we watch movies together and we're watching modern movies, I'll say to them, ooh, isn't that monster scary? And they just look at me and roll their eyes because it, it looks fake. You know, if you would ask me that when I was watching a horror movie back in the 80s, it scared the shit out of me. And I want to bring that back. We want to bring that back. So ever since I can remember, my brother and I would, you know, we, we would draw monsters and, with our crayons. You know, we would sculpt monsters with our Play-Doh. We would create things and props and make little movies with uh, my dad's VHS camera. You know, we, we had a blast, and we've always had a blast doing it. It never left us, and it's carried on to our adult life. One day, we were watching a movie together, and we just decided, hell, why don't we do this ourselves? Why don't we, why don't we start a little company and, and make props or make monsters and see, see where it goes, try to sell them or try to get involved in productions? So we did. We, we started, you know, telling people that <laughs> we were more professional than we really were. And, you know, we had, a little, we had a little portfolio put together of some small work we'd done that had never been used in anything. But, you know, we showed people anyway, and we made contacts and kept talking and talking. And eventually we got noticed, um, most recently with the production Uber Killer by Falcon Film Studios. Uh, I met the producer, Derek Gauchi, great guy. He... You know, saw some of my work and said, "Hey, I'll give you a chance." And we knocked it out of the park. You know, they they were they were kind enough. Uh, Falcon Film Studios was kind enough to you know furnish us with the supplies we needed. And you know, we took our time and we put together some great effects. Came up with some great ideas. And actually, they they loved it so much. We pretty much engineered the death scenes. Uh, it was really fun. We got to do a, a, a casting, a full head cast silicone head that we smashed we you know lots of creative ways that you know we did things working on a budget you know we've studied mountains of books and probably watched days worth of youtube tutorials and you name it and talked to people gone on forums and you know we put some serious time into into learning this craft of practical special effects and we love it so much trial and error during the the process you know we made mistakes but figured out ways to make it work you know within the budget and everything and really that's that's the heart of what Cryptcraft does after this production you know we were talking and we thought wouldn't it be great to create a network of talent you know why why are we trying to do this all on our own why why are we trying to get noticed you know with our small little projects why don't we expand and meet some talented actors or graphic artists makeup artists audio engineers you know, the whole works and the idea is that we're all trying to get noticed. We're, we're all trying to score that big project. And if we can refer each other and help each other out and learn new skills and get noticed, it's going to happen. So we've started to build this network and met a lot of great local actors and artists. And we, we feature them on our webpage, uh, which is cryptcraft.us. In fact, the, your host of this show, Steve Gray, is a member of the Cryptcraft family. Uh, his work can be seen on there, and you can read a small bio on him. And we don't just feature anyone who wants to be you know, part of the, the group. The family consists of you know, artists that we actually endorse, that we feel are talented. And also artists who actually have a love for horror and sci-fi and could be of use to future productions. It's kind of a you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back kind of a system, you know. You, we don't ask, you know, if, if you get a, a gig from being part of the Cryptcraft family, we're not going to ask you for a referral fee or, or a percentage or whatever. All that we ask is that, you know, if you, you're talking to someone and they're working on a project and they're looking for a guy who can make fake limbs or and they need a fake head for their movie or something you know we that's that's 
the whole idea. I can see in the future maybe it would change if we hit big or whatever, but right now this, the, the point is we're all trying to get noticed, so we're helping each other out. I want you know small filmmakers or any media project to be able to go to our webpage and, and find talent, local talent in their area, and find you know somebody who, people who are experts in, in making horrific media. Likewise, we're happy to help out. You know, if, even if you just have questions and you know you're trying to accomplish a, a specific effect or you need a song for a a movie or whatever. All we ask for is the credit. Just trying to get notice. You know, that's that's the goal. So Danny Hicks, Jay, if you guys are listening, which I'm assuming you probably will listen to the program, I mean, unless you hate the sound of your own voice or something. But again, you guys are you guys are more than welcome to be part of the Cryptcraft family. We'd be honored to feature you on the webpage if you so please. Uber killer. Uber Killer was a blast to make. Tons of blood, tons of gore, tons of swearing. It it's just a a good old slasher pick. Um, it's a short film. It runs about I think it's like in 23, 24 minutes, somewhere in that range. But it's about a you know an obnoxious group of college age dudes who are being picked off one by one in very creative and gruesome ways. And it's got a decent little twist at the end too. Derek Gauchi did a great job when he wrote the script. Surprisingly enough, when they they did casting, we tried out, and both my brother and I were uh, cast for parts in the film, and which got us even more involved in the the whole production. Uh, great crew to work with; uh, everyone did an awesome job, and uh, I was very pleased with the final product. Uh, it can be found on YouTube. I'm sure that Steve will include a link on this uh, program. That you can watch the film yourself and let us know what you think. You know, the great thing about the Uber Killer story is it's it's a modern take on a fear that a lot of people have, and that's riding in a car with a stranger. And with the rise of all these new transportation companies and taxi services, it seemed like a fitting anxiety to poke. But yeah, look out look out for some new projects we're working on here. My brother wrote a great script. Uh, it's called Unexpected Guest for Dinner. I'm not even going to get into the story. I'm just going to let you watch it when it comes out. It's a very, very short film. We plan it for it to be around five, six minutes. Uh, you know, we want to start getting into like the YouTube shorts. You know, making you know five, six-minute movies. And eventually, once life simmers down a little bit, we can we can crank out you know one a month or so. Additionally, uh, we're very happy to say that we're going to be working on a short with Steve Gray, host of this show. Uh, it's called Black Vineyard. Steve wrote it. Amazing story. And we look forward to, you know, making something scary as hell out of it. So, yeah, we, we were discussing X-Files the other day, how we're all very excited for the new show to come out. And coincidentally, X-Files is what got me into my full-time job, my day job. Uh, I am a cop. I'm in law enforcement. And when I was younger, you know, I grew up watching X-Files and, and I <laughs> embarrassingly wanted to be an FBI agent because of the X-Files show, which inevitably got me interested into the whole field of law enforcement. And here I am today, almost 10 years now with a badge. First in Florida, now in Michigan, my home. You know, on a side note, the law enforcement career really has helped with the whole special effects thing. I have seen some stuff, let me tell you. Um, probably more dead bodies and, and violence and gore than I ever wanted to see, but I, I have that. I have those sights, those, those pictures in my mind, and it certainly helps when going for realism when I'm making, you know, these practical effects. Steve, thanks again for having me on the show. And thank you for listening. Uh, please feel free to stop at the website, cryptcraft.us, and check out our portfolio, check out our network of talent. If you have any questions, just drop us a line. We're happy to help. Likewise, we're happy to help if you uh, need a severed foot or a mutant pig head or whatever. We'll make it. So check us out. Have a good one. Okay, that was my buddy Jake Murphy from Cryptcraft special effects studio honored to have him on the show with us today and i will provide a link in the description to their website so you can go and check out the magic that they perform for yourself and be ready for some exciting stuff coming from those guys in the future too 
Moving right along, I've got Jen. She's gonna serve up a nice batch of horror movie reviews, the Werewolf Edition. She'll be reviewing American Werewolf in London, The Howling, and Rob Bottin. Now let me just say something real quick. I'm partial to Rob Bottin's makeup effects, and I'm pretty sure Jake Murphy would agree with me. So before the reviews even start, of course my, uh, my vote goes for The Howling. But I'm going to go ahead and turn the microphone over to her and let her rock out some reviews for you. Take it away, Jen. This is Jen here with my horror movie reviews for the Rock and Roll Horror Movies and Tattoo Show. And today I'm reviewing The Howling as well as The American Werewolf in London, which is my all-time favorite movie. Um, There's a little bit of controversy in the gray household between these two movies because Steve's favorite movie has always been The Howling and mine has been American Werewolf. So um, every time we sit down to watch these two movies, there's a little bit of competition back to back of which one had the best transformation scene. So what I'm going to start off with first is The Howling, which was made and came out in 1981. It starred um, Patrick McNee as the therapist and you have the awesome Dee Wallace and her real life husband, Christopher Stone, that starred in the movie. And basically, the plot to the movie was Dee Wallace. She was a news anchor that was stalked by a serial killer um, that was in the long run attacked in a porno theater, which caused her to have post-traumatic stress syndrome of sorts. And then her therapist, which was Patrick McNee, recommended for her to go to a retreat called The Colony which in the long run was, unbeknownst to her, was infested with werewolves. And in there is one of the favorite transformation scenes by Steve, which was done by the character Robert Picardo as Eddie Quist. And there's a transformation scene that's inside of like, kind of like a lab that one of the characters go into. And and, um, it's a great movie. I'm not gonna say that. The Howling is a great movie. Werewolves are one of my favorites. I always said that if I ever had the chance to come back something a vampire a werewolf a mummy or something it would always be a werewolf because they've always been a fascination of mine but i will say the howling was a great movie um, because i do love d wallace i thought she was fantastic inside of the movie um but then i'm going to move on to my american werewolf in london which is my favorite it was also made in 1981 it was directed by john landis Um, It starred David Naughton and Griffin Dunn, and it was about two American students that were backpacking across Europe that got stuck over in London, and they kind of got caught up where they went to a bar, which was called The Slaughtered Lamb, and they got thrown out of there because, you know, the British weren't too kind to them being there. Um, because they were asking about, you know, one of the stars on the wall because they were plagued by, you know, the werewolf legend in that particular town. And what happens is, um, you know, Griffin Dunn gets tore up by a werewolf when they're out there walking on the moors and David Naughton actually survives but is, you know, becomes a werewolf. And to me, the transformation scene in American Werewolf in London was the absolute best. Um, I have to say because Rick Baker did a fantastic job in the transformation scene. You can see the hand growing, the body, the face, everything was just amazing. And the movie to me was just fantastic. I mean, the the special effects on both movies, the special effects directors were amazing. You have Rob Bottin from The Howling that also did The Thing, which is one of me and Steve's both favorite movies. And then you have Rip Baker that did the special effects for American Werewolf in London. So my idea to anybody that has never seen these movies or watched them back to back, definitely sit down and watch them. You know, post your reviews on the, on the page um, to let us know which one transformation scene you think is the best so that me and Steve can fight it out here in the gray household. Thanks everybody for listening. I appreciate it. Everyone have a great night. Rock and roll horror movies and tattoos. <laughs> Tales of the Tattoo.
Okay, people, welcome to the Tales of the Tattoo section of the show, where I ask viewers and listeners to, uh, you know, sort of write in to me and tell me the most interesting tale that they can in reference to uh, getting a tattoo or having someone else getting one. Um, I had to print this out. This Today's story comes to us from uh, Billy Vidic in Richmond, Virginia. Billy writes, Hey, Steve, I have a cool tattoo story for your show. I went with a friend into one of the shops here in Richmond. I font remember which one it was. I'm assuming that's supposed to be I don't remember, but fuck it, I'll just leave it the way it is. I font remember which one it was. And OMG, it was so cool. A guy was getting a tattoo of a cool monster. The guy was in such pain, I LOL'd. <laughs> I can't wait to watch the show. Sincerity, Billy Vidic, Richmond Virgin. <clears throat> well, there you have it. That that's um, <laughs> that that's today's story. Tales of the tattoos. Coming up, I've got Jay Tanzelli, who is the one half of the writing team, the Blood Brothers, who is going to join me for a special conversation and discuss some of the cool things that he has coming up, as well as some of the cool things that he's done in the past. So get ready for that. We're having a lot of fun today. It's the Rock and Roll Horror Movies and Tattoos Show. Okay, coming up next, I got Tanzelli who is one half of the writing team, the Blood Brothers. He's going to join me for an awesome conversation here. Hello? Hey, Mr. Tonzelli. Hey, how are you? Pretty good. Okay, I've got Mr. Joe Tonzelli on the line, who's one half of the writing team, the Blood Brothers, and he's joining me for an awesome conversation today. Joe, tell everybody hello. Hey, everybody. All right. Hey, I uh, just wanted to take a few minutes and have a talk with you and uh, maybe discuss some of the cool things that uh, you have on the burners right now, as well as some of the things that you've done in the past. Really enjoyed uh, the book that you have called The House on Creep Street. Can you tell everybody where that idea came from? How, how long it took to write? You know, just sort of a elaborate on uh, what, just the origins of the book, how it came to be. Sure, sure. Uh, well, how that came to be, when I was about 11 or 12 years old, I was writing stuff even then. Only as you can imagine, at 11 or 12 years old, you're not really spitting on anything that one would consider brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, but I had these two uh, blank journals that I had bought from the mall, um, and I would just like write down these random horror stories in there. Um, they weren't anything terribly original. They were more like stories that I had read previously that I liked. And so I just, I don't know, I felt like, well, I'm just going to rewrite my own versions of them. And so they were uh, rewritten versions of, you know, stuff from scary stories to tell in the dark. Or I think I had my own version of Dawn of the Dead in there. So, I mean, it was nothing terribly original either. So I did this for a couple of years. But, then, you know, then like most things, I put it aside and I focused on other things. And, uh, and it was about... Uh, I guess like five years ago maybe my parents were moving out of their uh, house the house where I grew up and I was helping them pack and I uncovered these books that I had written that I had not totally forgotten about but um, I guess you could say I had forgotten about some of the more <laughs> how shall we say um, ineptness of them all mm -hmm. so I took them out and I was reading through them and I thought man you know what like these are they're funny, but at the same time, there's this kind of like childhood charm to them that right. I think could maybe translate well into, um, I guess you could say, a more serious-minded version of them. So I, I show them to Chris Evangelist, my writing partner, um, and we, you know, I, he kind of had the sort of same reaction to them I did. I mean, he recognized the sort of unintended humor of them, but he also recognized that it sort of captured that same sort of that childhood love for horror and the creepy things, you know, the, the goosebumps and, like I said, the scary stories, the tell in the dark, that kind of stuff that if right. you're into, like, the horror genre as a kid, like, that's the kind of stuff that you sort of, like, latch on to. Mm -hmm. um, and so I said, like, listen, like, why don't we take some of these concepts and why don't we take this approach and see if we can sort of spin it into something that is actually, you know, <laughs> like readable. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of like what we did. And the concept is pretty much the same. Uh, you know, the original stories, they featured me as the 
well, not as every main character, but uh, I was a main character in a few of them, and even if I wasn't the main character, I was still the main character, if you know what I mean. Like, they may have had different names, but I was still writing from my own point of view, Mm -hmm. and I uh, featured two of my real childhood friends, um, and it was just about, you know, more often than not, it was about myself and my childhood friends getting into mischief around the neighborhood and looking into these creepy things. And um, and that's kind of where it took off from there. And we wanted to see if we could take that concept and turn it into something not 100% serious, but, you know, certainly more serious than the original incarnations. And that's how that whole thing took off. Mm-hmm. Well, I thought it was uh, a fantastic for, story. Wonderful story. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, as for the writing of it, um, pretty much our process for each book is We'll meet, we'll get together, and we'll sort of flesh out a pretty detailed outline. So while we're in the same room, we can deduce the beginning and the middle and the end. So there's no chance of, like, once the writing part actually kicks off, there's no chance of, uh, one, you know, either of us going off on a tangent or in a direction that neither of us anticipated. Right, right. What we do is once we have the outline, then we'll sort of take it chapter by chapter. Say, I'll write chapter one, and I'll send it to him. He'll read, he'll give thoughts, if any, and then he'll write chapter two. And then we alternate like that until we have, you know, we reach the ending of the story. Oh, and fantastic. I think Creep Street took about... I'd say maybe a little less than a year for the first draft, and then, you know, subsequent drafts and workshopping and stuff like that, I'd say maybe another six months, another year. Uh-huh. Now, did you... Um, and then, yeah, the rest, you know, as they say. Now, you, now, were you intentionally going... I think this... Me, personally, I think the story is extremely important because, especially in this day and age when there's such an emphasis on uh, bullying, you know, you hear about it in the news all the time, you know, there, there's just such a, you know, such an outcry of, uh, you know, just anti-bullying. You see it everywhere. But was that uh, a purposeful intention that you did to uh, make the story kind of like an anti-bullying story? Because that's what I got out of it. No, what? Ultimately, yes, that was something that we um, decided that we wanted to pursue because we knew that that would make it timely. We knew, I mean, uh, uh, to backtrack a little bit, when we had decided that this was something we wanted to do, the first rule, I guess you could say, that we imparted on ourselves was at no time did we want to feel like we were talking down to the kid audience, which I think some uh, literature for kids of that age group could tend to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we didn't want to treat the kids like they were kids. We wanted to treat them like they are real people who are experiencing real issues that maybe some adults, you know, as people age, they start to sort of discount the importance of the things that kids can go through. Um, and so, uh, to be honest, the fir- while the first couple drafts of the book did feature um, a sort of bullying aspect, it wasn't really the driving force of the story. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it wasn't until we had submitted the book uh, to author Mike Inks, you know, his imprint um, for consideration that he, you know, he had responded and said that um, he liked the book, but he had recommended that we really flesh out the bullying aspect because it was so prominent and it still is prominent and and you know and then we certainly did that and i think just that suggestion alone pushed that story into sort of a new level of i guess importance it really sort of changed the whole face of the book and what we were trying to say uh-huh. so i guess i get the short answer to your question is yes and no the book the bullying aspect was and was not intended mm-hmm. now you you say that now, did Mike Aloisi actually want you to scrub the bullying aspect of it, or was he wanting you to put more of an emphasis on it? Oh, um, yeah, he wanted us to enhance the bullying aspect. Yeah. Because he could see that it was kind of present in the draft that we had submitted, but he felt that more could be done with it to really um, sort of sell that point. Like, listen, bullying has really serious ramifications, and uh, if anyone is going to understand that, it, you know, it's a kid, especially these days. Right. Absolutely. And it was fantastic, man. I mean, it was just an awesome, you know, it was an honor for me to, you know, to narrate it also. And, um, you know, as I'm reading it, I'm thinking, wow, this is, this is just, this is an important story. Not only is it entertaining, you know, and then, you know, it has the supernatural aspects of it, which, you know, I don't, I can't think of a kid who doesn't like that. But then you add like an underlined important message there. 
you can actually reach somebody with that, you know. So, man, ha hats off to you. That's really great. And the whole Fright Friends, you know, the, the idea behind making it a series, is that is that something that you're pursuing as well, making it a series of books surrounding these guys? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, we actually, the second book um, is in press right now. We don't have a release date yet. Um, but, no, the Fright Friends are definitely on their way back, and we're hoping... Um, I mean, I don't know. I, once you have a second book, I guess that technically makes it a series. But no, we have scores and scores of ideas for new adventures that we would love to write. Um, so, you know, depending on how the first one continues to do and how the second one will do, um, you know, we could, uh, as long as we have ideas, we could keep this going forever. But, you know, obviously, like anything else, if there's a demand for it, then great, we're happy to go ahead with it. But if not, then we can at least say that we gave it our best shot right right well i, I definitely for one think that you're gonna go light years you know before it's over um oh, now well, thank you i hope so absolutely now can you divulge any information can you tell the fans anything about the new book oh it's, it's beware the monstrous answer so can you tell right. the fans anything about the new book that you have coming out yeah sure well the title is um beware the monstrous Panther. uh it's not a direct sequel to creep street i mean it's a sequel in the sense that you, you're gonna still have the same three lead boys as your characters the three friends um and there will be minor references to the first book but uh you know otherwise it's pretty standalone and what it involves is a creepy new neighbor moves in across the street from joey who is the a lead investigator, I guess you could say. Right. And Joey notices that while he's moving in, he notices that this new neighbor of his uh, carries in about 20 uh, pet carriers into mm -hmm. his house. Uh, they're small, about the size that would normally house um, a cat. And so, you know, Joey, being curious by nature, sort of begins to not spy, but keep an eye on his neighbor and things get progressively stranger around town. Pets start to go missing, um, and it, it all kind of coincides with uh, a friend from earlier in Joey's childhood that kind of fell off the map. Um, something happened between them, and then the kids grew apart, but then he, the one friend, his name was Glenn, he returns because uh, his pet has gone missing, and so it kind of reunites them, and, you know, then the Fright Friends all get involved, and they start looking into what might be happening around their town. And once again, there is, um, uh, I mean, I won't get into the how and, and, and why, but there is, again, there's, it's very much geared towards kids, mm -hmm. things that they're going through that, you know, um, adults may or may not be disregarding. And so there's still uh, uh, a pretty heavy message that hopefully, the, you know, the kids will respond to. Absolutely. I was just getting ready to say that. The, the, these stories that you have, they carry such an important message you know, that needs to be delivered, you know, it's great, you know, it's just fantastic, you know, because it's, and it's not just the mindless telling of a ghost story, which I love, I love I'm a horror fan here, but it's just cool that you're, you're delivering such a, a relevant message along with these, these tales of uh, terror. Yeah, that was uh, something that we had determined from the outset, um, I mean, like, you know, not to blow smoke up our own, but we, we had sort of decided, like, we're going to keep writing these until we feel like we're not trying to imbue anything important with them anymore. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, obviously, we, and we enjoy the supernatural, creepy aspects that we bring because we're just into that stuff. But if we're not putting that alongside some kind of takeaway for the kids that they can actually apply to their real lives, then we're not, it's, it, that, then that doesn't feel important to us and we're less interested in doing that. Well, I'll tell you what, it, it, it certainly sounds like you have an awesome journey ahead of you. And that actually leads me to my next question. Are you going to stay specific to the horror genre, or are you going to expand outside of that with these uh, Fright Friends guys? Um, I don't think we're ever, we're never going to have a book that I guess you could uh, term as having a realistic plot. Um, you know, there's no matter what we write about, there's going to be some aspect to it that, always kind of stays in that land of fiction and make-believe. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, and when I say that, I mean, like, the books are always going to be rooted in some kind of horror, uh, sci-fi, perhaps. Um, you know, it's never always going to be about ghosts or monsters, but it's not... It's going to be something that belongs in, you know, children's literature, and put it that way. Yeah. I mean, you're never going to put down one of these books and say, everything that's happened in this book can 100% happen in real life. <laughs> put it that way. Right, right. Almost like a uh, Stand By Me meets X-Files. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
exactly, exactly. That's a perfect way to put it. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, man. You definitely have an awesome fan base. Just the fact that you guys are, are doing what you're doing, you know, just delivering the message that you are, just really stands out and is just really awesome. Now, I did want to ask you, did you, how did you come to get hooked up with uh, Mike Aloisi and company? Was that something that you guys sought out, or did he come and seek you guys out, or how'd that work? You know what, that was the most random thing, and I'm going to have to start at like the very, very beginning, but I'll try to keep it brief. Mm -hmm. um, a few years ago, I guess like four years ago now, um, I wanted to join, I guess you could call it the blogging community, because um, I wasn't doing anything with my writing as far as putting it out there, sharing it. Like, I was still writing stuff, but I was just kind of doing it for myself. And I thought, you know what, I'll, I'll, let me try taking a crack at opening a blog and all news about movies and, and music and books that I've read and you know maybe I would post a short story every now and then and so I started doing that and in doing so I began creating um, I guess you could say professional associations you know a lot of PR companies people who were looking to have uh, impending new releases reviewed whether it be for movies or books or music or, or whatever mm -hmm. and so it was during this time that Mike's company was putting out uh, King Hodder's autobiography. And so I approached him and I said, listen, you know, I run this blog and I do book reviews and movie reviews and all the stuff that focuses entirely on the hard genre. So, and I asked for a reader's copy so I could read and review. And, you know, he was kind enough to send me one. And uh, I read the book, which is, I mean, as an aside, Kane Hodder's book is it's one of the best and honest auto. Have you had a chance to read it by any chance? Uh, yeah, I actually produced his audio book. Um, he actually recorded it in Los Angeles and sent me the files, and I edited and produced his audio book, and I agree with you. It's it's a completely awesome book. Oh, wow, that's awesome. I didn't know that. Yeah, it is. I mean, it was just, I was really taken aback at how honest and intimate that book really is. I mean, there is no detail about himself that he did not share because, um, I don't know, it was just uh, one of the best that I've read. But anyway, I did the review and I sent the review back to him and I was checking out his website and I was learning about, you know, his company and him himself. I learned that he was an author and that he was trying to get into the publishing game and to help out, you know, these other independent authors who were without representation. And I saw under, he was, you know, he had an open submission and he was looking for all these kinds of things. And he was looking for specifically anthologies relating to Halloween. And I thought, what are the odds of this? Because while I had opened the blog and working on it, I was also working on my own writing on the side that I was not sharing with anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to write just to keep my brain sharp, whatever. Right. So I was writing story after story that didn't, because they didn't have a home and they didn't have a purpose, I wasn't trying to make one as distinct from the previous. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, I always want to set a story, especially if it's horror related on Halloween, because I mean, why not? If you're gonna write a horror story, why not set it on the one day of the year that imbues Halloween, you know? Right. And so it was like, I wrote about three, four, five stories that were either set on Halloween or had this really thick Halloween atmosphere. And I, and then I kind of took a step back and I looked at these things, I said, wow, I kind of didn't even realize that this is what I was doing, that I now have these five stories that take place on Halloween or feel like Halloween. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, I said, well, I mean, we might as well keep it going. How many stories can you write um, that take place on Halloween and how different can you make them now that you realize what, what you're doing? And so I had done that and I had reached 13 stories and I guess I had a book or something of book length. And I thought, well, great, um, you have this now hang on to it and I guess you'll just figure out what you can do with it later if anything mm -hmm. and then I you know and then the blog took off and then I got hooked up with Mike and then I saw his submissions and I saw that he was looking for Halloween anthologies and I said this is too perfect to ignore I mean what are the odds of that it was just so serendipitous and so I sent the book and he really responded to it and wanted to publish it and he did and, and then sort of during that process Chris and I were also working on Creed Street we didn't really have an idea of what we were going to do with it once we were finished it um, and I you know and then I had said like listen like why don't we what, what, what's the worst that could happen if we submit it to my company and, and, and see what they think and so we did and and then, you know, he, he responded to it. He had suggestions to improve it, which we took to heart, and, and the book was massively improved for them. And then, you know, there you go. Mm -hmm. And then the same thing with Manther. You know, he was he 
actually, and this actually felt really good, uh, you know, after Grip Street was published and gotten it out there and he shot us an email, uh, you know, last year, a couple years ago maybe, and said, like, listen, do you have more of this? And we said, well, actually, yeah, if we're, you know, we're working on Mantha right now and he wanted to see it and so we sent it when we felt it was in a version that was worth reading and he responded to it even more than Creek Street. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think the Fray friends have a pretty good home right now. Yeah, yeah, Mike's a great guy, man. He's he's definitely got some got some awesome ideas, too, and it's cool that he's made the connections that he has, too, you know, what with uh, Kane Hodder and, uh, you know, Tom Savini and Eileen Dietz and all those people, you know, it's just great, you know, and you guys you guys have a bright future ahead of you, you know, with these stories and whatnot, and the it's like I told you earlier you know the the impression that i got from uh well just from creep street was just the just the overall importance of friendship you know just the overall importance of the value of looking out for human beings you know and just what they do i'm not going to give any details away obviously <laughs> but it's just the fact that they have such good hearts in the story you know that really relates realistically you know to uh to kids today it should you know it should it gives them a good message yeah yeah we um i guess as, i mean I, I don't want to i don't want to generalize but you know that your childhood experience shapes who you become as an adult and i think it also your experiences as, as a child puts you on a certain path to the interests that you're going to have and the passions that you're going to have and the outlook that you're going to have on life so mm-hmm. i think in a way i mean i don't want to get really schmaltzy and i don't want to get like really like psychoanalytic here but i think in a certain way being able to write these kinds of cautionary tales that are geared directly toward children. I think in a way we're looking back at our own childhoods and we're looking at the things that made us happy and we're looking at the things that didn't make us happy. And as for the things that didn't make us happy, it's like our chance to take those things head on and sort of confront them in a manner where we can take what was bad and we can spin them into something creative that will hopefully be beneficial to kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great idea. Great idea. Um, now, I did want to ask you, uh, do you have, other than uh, the Manther book uh, that getting ready to come out, do you do any public appearances uh, as far as do you do conventions or, or anything like that? And do you, or and if you don't, do you have plans to do so? Um, you know what, as of right now, the only, I wouldn't even really call them a, a public appearance. Um, every year, a few towns over from where we live in Collingswood, they do a yearly book festival. It's an outdoor event, um, and they've been doing it for over 10 years. I don't, I don't recall the number. Um, and it's, it attracts all kinds of people, all kinds of book vendors, all kinds of authors. Um, and then you're just there, and you're selling copies of your book, and you're getting to talk with people and other authors and, you know, book lovers. Um, and so we have done that a couple of years. We did have uh, a signing in Philadelphia, and that was, what's that? I think that was last I think sometime during winter. I think it was last February we were there. Um, uh, as for conventions, you know, we always look into them every time they come, but for various reasons, usually logistic or usually financial, we just can't quite make them work. But we're always open to that kind of stuff, and we're eager to do stuff like that. But, you know, I, unfortunately, the, the books are the books are doing okay, but, uh, you know, like everyone else, we still have to maintain our usual 9 to 5. So, mm-hmm, right. unfortunately... That, that has to come first, and so because of that, it's very difficult to plan. But you know, hopefully, that'll change in the future. Right. And then we can get out there, and we can meet people, and we can make those kinds of appearances. Right. Well, Joe, I just want to say thank you very much for uh, talking with me today. Uh, it's been an awesome, awesome conversation. Um, look forward to the book that's coming out in the future, and uh, best wishes with everything that's going to happen even further than that. I know you're going to do great. This is Joe Tonzelli, and you've been listening to the Rock and Roll Horror Movies and Tattoo Show. Okay, folks, that wraps it up. That does it for this episode two of the Rock and Roll Horror Movies and Tattoos YouTube Show. And until next time... Hooray!